Good afternoon again. I brought two Bibles, the green one and the red one. The good stuff's in the green one, and the red one, well, and it's, it's almost worn out, but it has good stuff as well. Um, the the uh, green one's my German Bible. I'd like to revisit a topic that we looked at, um, my recollection is correct, about seven years ago. At least part of it was in 2016. It's hard to believe how, how quickly time goes. And the topic is this, practicing truth in a post-truth culture 2.0. Practicing truth in a post-truth culture 2.0. In the year 2016, I mean, the Oxford Dictionary always selects a word for the year. And in 2016, the word of the year was, you guessed it, post-truth. Post-truth. Uh-oh, uh somebody's not happy. <laughs> I, I like the sound of that, you know? It, um, that means we've got life. Uh, and spunk. Okay, so in, in 2016, the word of the year was, after much discussion, debate, and research, post-truth. I think about that. A year being defined by the term post-truth. It's an adjective defined as relating to or denoting circumstances in which objective facts are less influential in shaping public opinion than appeals to emotion and personal belief. I mean, that, that, is, that is very unsettling. It was back then, and it is even more so today because we have even moved further. And I, I want to sketch out at the outset here a little bit on what is the same and what has changed and what some of the consequences are of uh, changes that occurred around about that time. Remember in 2015, and on June 26th, was the famed Obergefell and Hodges ruling of the Supreme Court where they deemed that the uh, s s that the Constitution somehow all of a sudden contained the right for, of same-sex marriage. Now, what was, um, and if you ever want to read something that is uh, in legalese, brilliantly penned and also just scathing, um, read the dissent by the late Justice Scalia. He, he wrote a number of things on this particular topic, and he looked at it from a, uh, he, he said we should worry about our democracy. Because all of a sudden now you have um, rope men on a bench that are playing the role of legislature and are um, penning into law something that the Constitution would have never anticipated. Um, but that's 20, uh, 2015. And I think it's appropriate that the following year is this word post-truth. Because I think we forget how fast things have changed. So let me sketch out a little bit of the politics leading up to this. In 2008, when Barack Obama uh, was candidate for president, he ran on a political platform that marriage can only be between a husband and a wife, a man and a woman. I mean, back then they still knew the difference, okay? That's 2008. In 2012, during his re-election campaign, that was still the official position. Because not doing so would have uh, been politically incorrect. And then by the end of his term, by the end of his term, as this uh, landmark ruling indicates, you were a bigot if you did not believe that men have a right to marry men and women have a right to marry women. That's in a period of less than four years that occurred. The truth of what had been that a, a, a truth that all cultures practically for millennia have recognized is that marriage is an institution for a man and a woman all of a sudden got dispensed. And that, that has big implications. So that was 2015, 2016, seven, seven years ago. Think about all the things that have changed as it relates to um, facts versus feeling. We've, we've, we've gone downhill fast. Today, we don't even know for sure 
whether someone was a man or a woman. I, I mean, that, that's, that is, that's just uh, astounding. And uh, gender identity is a serious problem. And I don't want to uh, underestimate the, 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 the fact that this is a, not just a, it's a serious problem for individuals, particularly young people, getting confused um, about this topic. And it's something that um, needs to be addressed. But the point is simply this. When, when feelings dictate ver versus objective fact, all kinds of chaos ensues. And we, we have seen a destabilization not only of the family and society, but the, the uh, complete geopolitical makeup of the world is being reformed um, around some of these ideas. Ideas have consequences, big ones. Let's just, I have here um, a couple of quotes that I wanted to um, quote to you. We want to define reality as we see fit. Sometimes, moment by moment, our culture seems to have embraced confusion as a virtue and shunned certainty as sin. I think about that. Confusion is a virtue and certainty is sin? And why? Because certainty based on objective facts stands in the way of today's highest ideal, unfeathered individual autonomy. You know, by if individuals get to determine uh, determine facts as they perceive them by feelings instead of objective facts, it by definition will create a lot of confusion because your reality, I mean, your truth and my truth and your truth is logically going to be different, okay? I mean, there, is, there are things, of course, where you can have different perspectives. I'm not ruling that out. I'm talking about biological facts, political facts, and truth as defined in the Bible. When we depart from that, chaos will ensue. I mean, these are broad principles that go back to the creation. You remember Genesis chapter 1? You know, God created the heavens and earth. And, you know, he, he was creating order out of chaos. In Hebrew, tohu and bohu had occurred because they departed from and Satan rebelled against the Almighty, and, and that's what happened. It was the creation. One of the things that God did is he created order. That's why we can be certain that tomorrow morning and this evening the sun will set on time. That's not a feeling, and it's not based on feelings. Continuing, as if to prove the point, Oxford Dictionaries has selected post-truth as its 2016 word of the year. According to Oxford, something is post-truth if it is, quote, relating to or denoting circumstances in which objective facts are less influential in shaping public opinion than appeals to emotion and personal belief. To qualify, the word of the year need, need not be new. As Katie Steinmetz of Time Magazine reported, it must capture the culture's mood and preoccupations. We're preoccupied with lies. I mean, that, that is an end-time dynamic, and they believe the lie. Post-truth does exactly that. Although it dates back to at least 1992, its usage has ballooned in 2016 by 2,000%. And it's continued on that course. Truth has to be personal if it is to touch our minds and hearts. There are facts that are important for existence, like the fact that water boils at sea level at 100 degrees centigrade. I mean, you can rely on that. You know, we're up 1,100 feet. It boils a little bit quicker. Uh, in uh, Fahrenheit is 212 degrees. Um, if you put it in a pressure canner uh, at 15 PSI, it's 249 degrees. Those are laws of physics that work. You know, I, I can't just get up one morning and say, you know what, 
I think today we're going to boil water at 180 degrees and we're going to save 30% on energy today. Why? Because I said so. You know, try that out and see how it works for you. <clears throat> but uh, is that tidbit relevant to us in a sense that it answers the questions that stalk our minds late into night? Did any of us wake up this morning grateful that water boils at 100 degrees, not 101? You see, these, these are things that are set in order that we can rely upon. Another, you know, this, this, this article has, <laughs> I don't know if you can see this or not, but it has a sign pointing one direction, it's feelings, and another sign pointing in the other direction that says facts. And it's, I, I'm, it, it, it's a pretty good depiction of the way the world is going. Now, what we want to do and what we need to do is to align our feelings with facts so that we are in sync with the created order. And when we do it, life begins to work, just like, you know, the water. It, it, we know that it's going to boil at 100 degrees centigrade. Here's an imp uh, another important thing. Unfeathered individual autonomy can only lead to chaos. Think of the question we now pose. What does it mean to be male or female? Are those the only two possibilities? Of course not. You go to Facebook. I mean, the new social device. And I think they have a 54 or so. Now, you thought German grammar was difficult with only three genders, okay? Now, all of a sudden, you have 54. Fortunately, the grammarians have stuck to three at this point to the extent, it was the exception of pronouns, you know, where you have to uh, work, work around that. It creates a chaos. What does it mean to be male or female? Are those the only two possibilities? Can we perhaps merge our bodies with computers, improving ourselves, and thereby becoming our own gods? That's no joke. The... the, the Artificial intelligence to have uh, some device put in your brain, and they're, they're actually talking about now uh, the ability to upload your consciousness so that you can attend your own funeral. And, and we're, we're a year or two away from that, they claim. To me, when you start looking at some of these things, the whole idea of a beast power um, makes a lot more sense than it did even a decade ago. Um, I don't know if you, uh, Boston, um, what was the name of the company? Boston Robotics, I think it is, that makes all of these uh, different robots and have the four-legged ones, you know, that run uphill and all of that. I mean, it's, it's, it's amazing to watch them. And then they have the ones that stand up, you know. They can climb ladders, jump from one platform to another, and, you know, you fall over and you get back up, and, you know, the dexterity, you know, Mr. Um, I say Mr. Andy. Andy from uh, uh, Cleveland was talking about dexterity. I, I mean, they're, they, these fingers and stuff, they're getting getting very close. And the, the, the AI is uh, getting to the point where, I don't know if you saw Mr. Kubik's uh, post here a few weeks ago, he, he, he entered uh, just a couple instructions about the Sabbath into chat GPT and said he wanted a poem of 120 words. 15 seconds later, he had a poem written by uh, artificial intelligence, and I read the poem, and it was actually pretty good. I mean, it, it, it rhymed, it was verse, it had 120 words, and, you know, you, you would think something as obscure as the Sabbath, you know, there wouldn't be much out there for the AI to work on. Not so. I mean, they've uploaded everything. <clears throat> See here, what else I have? Okay. Um...
This is, this is an article written by Roger Olson. He is a um, theologian, just a, a couple um, of quotes. Long before discovering that post-truth is an actual English word, I had begun to suspect that the condition it names is becoming extremely prevalent in American culture. In my opinion, many Americans simply do not care about objective facts as much as they care about feelings when it comes to formulating their beliefs. This culture or condition causes me and should cause you no end of consternation because it's unreliable, it's chaotic. As a theologian and an ethicist, I'm especially concerned about American Christian seeming lack of interest in truth in my field of study, research, writing, and teaching. Christian seeming lack of of interest. And that's, um, in, in my view, I mean, this is from the fifth book of John. I think the blame of where we have arrived as a culture today lies largely in the so-called Christian world, because um, we have been too passive. And what I mean by that is, you know, we had the Cultural Revolution, the Sexual Revolution of the 60s. We had Roe v. Wade in the 70s. Fortunately, that got overturned, which um, I never thought I would live to see that day. So that, that's a very good thing. But we've been passive. And all you need, I think there's a quote like this, for evil to triumph is for good men to do nothing. That can't be the case for us, hence the title, Practicing Truth in a Post-Truth Culture 2.0. Let's go to 1st John. 1st John. In, in some respects, um, you know, this is not new. Jesus said that you are of your father the devil, and he was a liar from the beginning. I mean, that's, that's really the source of all the confusion. But we read something here in 1 John chapter 1, beginning in verse 5. This is a message which we have heard from him and declared to you that God is light, and in him is no darkness at all. It's interesting how light and darkness uh, metaphorically are contrasted with one another. And actually, you know, without light, there can be well, I guess there is deep sea life that uh, seems to be absent of light. But the, the spring of the year that we see emerging is largely powered by light. I mean, the photosynthesis and everything that happens, I mean, isn't it nice? I mean, we drove down to Cambridge this morning and everything is getting green. We've got water. All we need is a, another warm week and a thunderstorm and, boom, you know, everything will spring to life. And that is largely powered by light. If we say that we have fellowship with him and walk in darkness, we lie and do not practice the truth. If we say we have fellowship with him and walk in darkness, we lie and do not practice the truth. You see, that's what this is a culture not only of confusion, but of darkness. And when that occurs, the truth, it says here, is not in them. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanses us from all sin. You know, we've just experienced that. We've just celebrated that. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. I mean, that's been the story from the beginning. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we say that we have not sinned, we make him a liar, and his word is not in us. I mean, this sketches out... Truth and error, lies and sinfulness, 
And if we are to practice truth in this post-truth culture, we must, according to Christ, do one thing. Just one. This comes down to a very simple concept in one respect. Just one thing that we do, and it will have three practical outcomes. And that's what we're going to look at, and these are tools that we can use to practice truth. Truth is something you do, that you rely on. You know, the integrity of design of this building can give us confidence it's not, uh, that's not going to fall apart. We're replacing a floor on Monday. Uh, we compromise the integrity of the design by driving a big machine over top of a floor that wasn't designed a number of years ago, and there was a kaboom and loud noises. So now the engineers have designed things, and it's going to get installed to create a mess and, and all kinds of disruption. But the I-beams that go in there is all based on an objective fact. And we know that we will not be breaking the floor again because the supporting structure is in place. That's just true. We can't, you know, we can't say one day, you know what, I feel that I can drive a big tow motor across this floor that's rated at 200 pounds per square inch. Why don't we try 2,000? I feel like it's strong today. See how that works for you. Come with me to John chapter 8. John chapter 8. This is under the heading, The Truth Will Make You Free. That has a nice um, ring to it from an outcome perspective. Verse 30, and he spoke these words, many believed him. Then Jesus said to the Jews if, who believed him, If you abide in my word, you are my disciples indeed. And you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. The operative word here is, the if-then statement here is, if you abide in my word. You are my disciples indeed, and you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. Freedom, by definition, and by fact, and as demonstrated in cultures down through time, is is connected intrinsically with truth. You can't be free if you don't know truth. The two are connected here, and the operative word in the singular way to practice truth is to abide in my word. And they say, okay, abide. I mean, the translators, uh, translators always struggle to translate meaning when it comes to concepts and actions, verbs in particular, because it is rare that there is a, that there is a word in the target language that embodies everything that the original intended. So invariably what happens is you leave some of the meaning behind and introduce elements of meaning in the target language, in this case English, that was never in the Greek. It's unavoidable. And I think this is a, a case, you know, you abide in my word. It's just, it's very, it's a word that to me is kind of on the feely side. Abide in me. Okay, what, so how does that work? So I have a very um, specific, highly theological way to tell you about how the, what this word means. Now, the Greek, well, I'll give you the Greek definition for, uh, first. The Greek word is men, meno, and it can mean it's a primary verb that means to stay in a given place, relation, or expectancy, to abide, to continue to dwell, to endure, to be present, to remain, to stand, to tarry for, and et cetera, et cetera. So you see the variant meanings, okay? In my green Bible, okay, um, 
which I consult on issues like this because German has some additional grammatical um, constructs that enables, gives the, shall we say, the translators a few more tools to bring across meaning, um, usually with a bit more impact. And that's just kind of the way the, the, the language word works. So in the German translation, it says, wenn ihr in meinem Wort bleibt, the word, the word for abide is bleibt. Now, let me, let me uh, define what that means. That's actually a command for dogs in German. Um, so I was uh, in um, Germany a few years ago. Actually, I was, I was there in December and visited, once again, some friends in Basel. And they're dog people. They have a dog. And, you know, their children are gone and gone. And this, this is probably the most expensive dog in Basel. And he gets all kinds of treats. And he goes to dog school every week to further his education. Among other things, uh, when, when you tell this dog, and he, and he understands German to boot, when you tell this dog, bleib, he knows exactly what to do. It is the equivalent of the um, English dog command. I said, you know, this is, this is really scientific um, theology here. It's the equivalent of the English dog command. Does anybody want to guess? Sit. No, it's not sit. Stay. There you go. You say, bleib, you know, you usually they also sit down and they just, they know they have to stay. If we take that and put it into the context and use the translation, stay in my word. It gives a completely different meaning to the, to the uh, verse than the more ambiguous term, abide. And, well, I read to you the Greek, the Greek meaning. It says here, it's a primary verb, to stay. So as we see the world continue to come apart, the place to go for truth is, is right here. We got to stay in there and know what is going on, and you will find the answer to a whole bunch of things for a post-truth world, not the least of which is God said, let us create a male and female, which confirms from the very beginning the binary nature of sexuality that is baked into the DNA in, in just about all forms of life, if not all forms. So just remember, stay, bleib, the dog. John chapter 17, verse 17. John chapter 17, verse 17. Here's a, shall we say, a pithy quote with respect to truth. Sanctify them by your truth. Your word is truth. He's, he's here praying in verse 15, I do not pray that you should take them out of this post-truth world, but that you should keep them from the evil one. And the methodology here is, Sanctification through the Word of God. Stay in it. Hang on to it because it is the anger by which um, we can live by as the world continues to spiral out of control. And I remember a professor at Ambassador once said, and you know, you think about it, this would have been 1992. And uh, you look back to 1992 and you think, oh, I mean, everything was way back then, you know, things were very good. But, I mean, it was all, already heading in that direction. And, and his point was simply that, you know, you can look at truth as the, the, the center point 
And the farther you get away from truth, the more unhinged you become. And you know, if, if, if you have something that's rotating around an axis, the farther out you get from truth, the more chaotic it becomes. I mean, I'm trying to paint, you know, when, when you talk about the integrity of design and the I-beams on the floor and all of that, you know, that's very mechanical. The, the fact is that principles, ideas, and philosophical constructs have the same impact in a very tangible way. It's just a little bit more difficult maybe to, to define. But you, can't, you cannot defy truth. You know, gravity. I'm, I feel like gravity is not in effect today. I'm going to go up on the Sears Tower, like, like I did um, in, in February when I was out there for a show. And I'm just going to walk out to Lake Michigan. Now, you might be able to glide out if you have a hang glider or a parachute, because you're up high enough to do that. You can't make facts go away because you feel a different way. Second Timothy chapter three. I mean, these are basic anchor scriptures. And if we keep the basics down, um, we won't get washed away in the things that are going on. <clears throat> so let's look at, let's look at the whole, I mean, ultimately we want to get to verse 16, right? I mean, everybody knows that scripture. All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. I mean, that is a, an anger scripture. But let's look at the the context by reading verses 10 through 17, and, and you, you see the larger impact of it and, and why Paul was writing to Timothy and what some of his circumstances were. Verse 10, but you have carefully followed my doctrine, manner of life, purpose, faith, long-suffering, love, perseverance, persecutions, afflictions, which happened to me in Antioch in a, in, and at Iconium, at Lystra, what persecutions I endured, and out of them all the Lord delivered me. Now bear in mind, he's writing this from prison. So um, Paul was, by any estimation, a pretty optimistic individual. Um, I'm always amazed. I mean, it was Timothy, the free man, that was having some second thoughts and was distraught. Yes, and all who desire to live godly in Christ Jesus will suffer persecution. But evil men and imposters. You know, an imposter is someone that pretends to be something they're not. It's post-truth. They're an actor at best, a hypocrite at worst. Evil men and imposters will grow worse and worse, deceiving and being deceived. But as for you, continue in the things which you have learned and have been assured of, knowing from whom you have learned them, and that from childhood you have known the Holy Scriptures, which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith which is in Christ Jesus. Timothy was the product of an immersion into the, in the Scriptures from the time he was a child. And if there's one thing that, I mean, the, the number one responsibility of parents is to have the scriptures stay in their kids. Because that will, that will go with you. And that will strengthen you. That the man of God, verse 17 may be complete, thoroughly equipped for every good work. Because it's true. All scripture is given by inspiration of God, and we just read that your word is truth. Jesus Christ embodied truth. 
If we want to know in principle how this works, you just look at what Jesus did and do likewise and you become like him and you are aligning yourself not with how you feel today. I mean, I, sometimes I get up in the morning, I don't feel that great, you know? Maybe I don't want to go to work, although that's rare. I kind of like to work, okay? But if we leave it to feeling, anything goes. 2 Timothy chapter 4. Continuing here. This is post-truth. I charge you, therefore, before, the God, before God and the Lord Jesus Christ. I mean, he... <laughs> I don't know how you make it a little bit any, any stronger than this. I charge you, therefore, before God and the Lord Jesus Christ, who will judge the living and the dead at his appearing and his kingdom, preach the word, be ready in season and out of season, convince, rebuke, exhort with all long-suffering and teaching. Verse 3, for the time is coming when they will not endure sound doctrine. So it was coming way back then. They won't endure the truth because they have itching ears but according to their own desires because they have itching ears they will heap up for themselves teachers and they will turn their ears away from the truth and be turned aside to fables but you be watchful in all things endure afflictions do the work of an evangelist fulfill your ministry when you when these teachers turn away from the truth to fables, it's post-truth. And that is precisely what is happening today in ways that I could have never imagined even 10 years ago. I just, I, 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 I just, uh, it was unthinkable. that we would get to the point that we did, even though, I mean, it, it has happened before. Second Timothy chapter 2, just a couple pages forward. Let's look at chapter 2. <clears throat> Beginning in verse 14. Remind them of these things, charging them before the Lord not to strive about words to no profit, to the ruin of the hearers. Be diligent to present yourselves approved to God, a worker who does not need to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. You stay in it and know what it says. And if there's one thing that, to me, in my short lifetime has become apparent, it is the veracity of Scripture and the truth of it. And in, in one sense, the, the more chaotic things get, the more apparent that is. I mean, that's, I guess, um, a good thing. I, I, don't, I don't need the Bible any longer to debunk some of the latest post-truth stuff. I mean, it's decidedly unscientific. You know, science in the Western, in Western culture, what caused enlighten, the en so-called enlightenment to happen um, was the fact that scientists like Newton I and mean, the other big names, they actually believed in God because the universe had regularity. I've been having fun with moon, the, the moon this week. I mentioned something in my sermon on the, on the last day. And you can calculate the size of the moon out three decimal places, two to second, hundreds if not thousands of years in advance. And when it comes to pass, it happens right on time. And you can do it at any part of the world, all around the globe. It's a heavenly clock to which we still calibrate. I know, I mean, the rotation of the earth and you know, that all is changing, or so we're told. Um, but you still have the rotation that 
every everything works the way we count time. Um, we need to rightly divide these things and not be shaken with um, the latest stories uh, or fables, I should say. Okay, so we stay in the word. Got that? Just stay in the word. It's simple. Stay in the word. Memorize it. I mean, right now, it's so easy. Hey, Google. Oops, I better. That, that was not a good idea. Oh, Google said, how can I help you? Well, don't say anything, okay? You can, you can go, hey, Google, and ask just about any question, and boom, in seconds, uh, it comes up. You know, find this topic or that topic in the Bible. Um, it's great. I, I, it, it's a great thing, but it also can come, become a crutch. I mean, if, if Google goes away one day, um, we've, we've got a lot of dumb people that have smartphones, Okay, that's, that's, that's the, the way that works. But so we stay in the word, memorize it. And one of the things that we like about the school my grandkids go to is they, they have a memory verse every week, right? And uh, it's amazing how much um, uh, kids can learn and memorize. Um, and and that, that's a great thing because once it's in there, it sticks. And uh, they, they can always rely on that. So let's look at the, the outcomes. The first outcome, if you stay in his word, in John chapter 8, verse 31, is he will be his disciple. That's a promise. Just, just let's, let's look at that in, in John chapter 3. Uh, John, sorry, John chapter 8. John chapter 8, then Jesus said to those Jews who believed him, if, you know, it's, this is as certain as Boolean logic in a computer program, which usually starts with an if statement. If you abide in my word, you are my disciples indeed. What does that mean in practical terms? It means that those who do not stay in his word, the opposite of it is, will not be his disciples. There's a difference between being a disciple that is emulating Jesus Christ and somebody who professes to be one. And usually it occurs because they're not staying in his word. They feel like they're Christian. They profess to be Christian. But it is just an empty profession with no basis in fact. We see that in, in Matthew chapter 7. Matthew chapter 7. Verse 21, this is what it looks like for those who profess but don't stay in his word. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father in heaven. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in your name, cast out demons in your name, and done many wonders in your name? And then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. So there are, there are those who profess but practice lawlessness. A departure from the law of God, which is the basis for all regularity. And if we, if we take the Ten Commandments, I've said this before, if we as a society would only consistently keep one of them. Take stealing, for example. We could balance the, natu the, the national budget if you took away all the expense that is incurred to prevent stealing. That's just, if you depart from that, you can 
profess to be anything you want doesn't make it so. You have to do the will of my Father in heaven, and then you are a disciple. Matthew chapter 12. There are many different things you could cite. Matthew chapter 12, and we'll look at verse 50. For whoever does the will of my Father in heaven is my brother and sister and mother. So what we see here is that the discipleship is actually uh, described in terms of a family. You know, he, he was told um, that his, uh, the multitudes were there, and he said, look, your mother and your brothers are standing outside seeking to speak with you. And he answered and said to the one who told him, who is my mother and who are my brothers? And he stretched out his hand toward his disciples and said, here are my mother and my brothers. If you abide in my word, you are my disciples indeed. The outcome of staying in the truth of God's word is discipleship. Number one. Number two. Number two is you shall know the truth. It is not an accident that the most highly functional freest society in the history of man was based even on a fractional basis on Judeo-Christian ethics. They stayed in his word. The, the founders of this great nation um, all had Bibles and they had various perspectives, but they believed it to be true and they wrote into the governmental structure elements of the truth contained in the Bible the judicial system and the governance and, and all of that. We'll look at some of the um, components of it here in a minute. You shall know the truth. Let's go to Psalm 119. Psalm 119. Psalm 119, verse 160. Remember we, we read what Paul said to Timothy? All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable, you know, I, uh, which means productive. You know, we, profit gets a bad rap. The reality is without profit, nothing can really happen. Verse 160 says, The entirety of your word is truth. And every one of your righteous judgments endures forever. Wow. I create, let us create man in our image, according to our likeness. Male and female, he created them. You'll know that truth? That's factual it says the entirety of his word be included in that psalm chapter 25 psalm chapter 25 these are outcomes you'll know the truth my late father went to public school in the big metropolis of New Bedford, if you've ever been there. And actually later ended up owning the school that he went to, the building. And they did the unthinkable. They prayed every morning when they went to school. And they read the Psalms, a whole chapter, every morning. Psalm chapter 25. Verse 5. Oh, yeah, they also had the Board of Education. It's a very different board of education than we have today. It, 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 was, it was about this long, and it had holes drilled in it so that it could be a little bit more effective. And uh, he, he uh, used to tell the story about my Aunt Mary. And they had outdoor facilities, 
And some boys thought it would be um, a good joke to throw rocks into the outdoor facilities. And Aunt Mary, you know, there was a, like a lot of these, it was almost built like a fort. It had this wooden structure around where you went into the, quote, facility. So she peers over top of the fort to see whether it was all clear to go um, and fell and busted her chin. And uh, the teacher didn't take so lightly to that. Um, so he availed himself to the Board of Education, to the pranksters that were into this. And my dad said you could hear him all the way down the hall. And he broke the board on their backside. They never bothered my Aunt Mary again. You know, somehow um, they got the message. Verse 5 of chapter 25, lead me in your truth. And teach me, for you are the God of my salvation. It, part of the truth, a very large part of the truth, is the message of hope and salvation in the person of Jesus Christ. <clears throat> John, chapter, John chapter 1, verse 14. And you have the word in verse 14 that came to be flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory. The glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. You know, he personified this um, combination, gracious truth. And they beheld his glory. They, they, they as John wrote in, in, in elsewhere in his writings, that they, they could touch and feel the creator of life. I mean, these are things that they knew and knew very deeply. You know, it, it's, I, I was reading an article uh, a week or so ago about, you know, um, the, the argument that, well, you know, the disciples... Um, stole the body of Jesus and made up this lie that Jesus was resurrected. To what end? You think about it. What benefit they ever attain, would they have attained if this is all a big lie? They, they were cut apart, crucified, chased all over the Roman Empire. Um, you don't make up a lie for that. But if you've had an encounter with someone that was dead yesterday and walks into your living room, and I didn't walk into the living room, appeared in the living room and said, peace be with you. Now, you've, now, now this has taken it to a whole different level. And Paul, the apostle, had this encounter on Damascus Road it changed him. It, the, 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 the resurrected Christ changed the disciples in dramatic ways, and it was truth that they knew and could touch. Thomas, the doubter, you know, stuck his finger into the wounds. We know that by staying in his word. John chapter 14, verse 4. To Thomas, Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. We wouldn't know this, save the word of God. You know, don't let anybody say, well, you know, is this really the word of God? Well, <laughs> we wouldn't know about it if we didn't have the written word of God. I mean, there was the... There's the idea that, okay, God spoke to me, and you know, I'm not taking away from the fact that that happens, but you always have to calibrate it to the written word. 
doesn't supersede it. The third thing, the third outcome of staying in his word is the truth shall make you free. That's deeply embedded into our national psyche. And, um, and there's a reason for that because um, of what is inscribed on the liberty bell. I mean, this vision of freedom. It, I mean, vision is one of those intangible dynamics that, you know, if it, it's so powerful if people believe it. And you had teeming masses come from all over the world in pursuit of what? The vision of freedom. However that might have looked like, they came from all over the world, and, and that vision caused people that were bickering and fighting in the old world, whether religious or otherwise, to set aside that in the pursuit of a common vision. The vision was more compelling, and we've, we've got a great vision. Jesus Christ was a great visionary. And the pursuit of truth uh, is part of that. And when, when we do that, it, it makes some of the petty little things just kind of go away, you know? When we have too much time on our hands is usually when we get um, into trouble. It's that way in the workplace. You know, we are so busy, people don't have time to get into petty arguments because they just have to work. Let's look at Leviticus chapter 25. Leviticus chapter 25. This is talking about the year of Jubilee. In the um, biblical calendar, you have sets of seven. So you go seven times seven, you have 49, and then you've got the um, 50th year, um, which is the year of release. All debts are forgiven. I told my bank that one time. Um, Signed loan documents, and we went to dinner to to celebrate the fact that I had indentured myself to a bank for a number of years. And and I told my friend Tom Greathouse, I said, um, "I'm really glad we did this. You know, you believe in the Bible, don't you?" He said, "Oh yeah, I believe in the Bible." I said, "Well, there's this Bible and the scripture in the Bible that you get released from debt every seven years." He said, not that part. <laughs> he was a banger first. Okay. Verse 9, chapter 25. Then you shall cause the trumpet of the jubilee to sound on the tenth day of the seventh month, on the day of atonement. You shall make the trumpet sound throughout all your land. And you shall consecrate the fiftieth year and proclaim liberty throughout all the land to all its inhabitants. It shall be a jubilee for you. And each of you shall return to his possessions, and each of you shall return to his family. This, is, this was emblazoned onto the liberty bell to proclaim liberty throughout the land. It's, you know, it's an idea. I mean, this, this system was actually a great economic system because it prevented the concentration of wealth into uh, the hands of a few, which... Uh, capitalism, one of the downsides of it is that tends to happen. You know, capitalism is the worst economic system ever devised by man except for all the rest that we've tried from time to time. You know, that's, um, it, it's the best system that we've had, but this is a different one. If we, if we did this, you know, every seven years, a lot of things would happen. Um, you know, people would, wouldn't take on as much debt I mean, our, our system is designed for debt. Um, and, you know, I dare say people probably would have that wicked thought <laughs> that is described here that, you know, somebody has need and, 
and and you say, well, you know, it's the seventh year coming up. I'm not sure I want to lend money to him because he's probably not a good credit, and after all, in a year, it's all going to get erased. It's actually uh, described as a wicked thought. I mean, these are th these are liberating concepts. A society that would abide by this would be would look. Very, very different. Luke chapter 4. Luke chapter 4. Verse 16, and he came to Nazareth where he had been brought up, and as his custom was, this is what he customarily did, he went into the synagogue on the Sabbath day and stood up to read. And he was handed the book of the prophet Isaiah, and when he had opened the book, he found the place where it was written, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because he has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor, and he sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to preach deliverance to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind, and to set at liberty those who are oppressed, and to preach the acceptable year of the Lord. Then he closed the book and gave it back to the attendant and sat down, and the eyes of all who were in the synagogue were fixed upon him. And he began to say to them, Today this scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. This was a proclamation of liberty. That was a prophecy that was fulfilled by Jesus Christ. Um, and um, one of the most um, profound things I experienced when we were in Israel was looking at the scroll of Isaiah that predates Christ by two or three hundred years. And it is a, it, I'm going to say an exact facsimile in all material respects of the book of Isaiah, Isaiah that we have between these two covers. That was, that was really profound to look at something and say, you know what? Jesus read about himself from a scroll like this about his mission to provide freedom, to proclaim liberty. And that's what we become. We become liberated when we uh, stay in his word. Romans chapter 8. Verse 1, there is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus, who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. For the law of the Spirit of, of life in Christ Jesus have made, has made me free from the law of sin and death. Dropping down to um, verse 6, for to be carnally minded is death. But to be spiritually minded is life and peace, because the carnal mind is enmity against God, for it is not subject to the law of God, nor indeed can be. So then, those who are in the flesh cannot please God, but you are not in the flesh, you are in the Spirit, if indeed the Spirit of God dwells in you. Now, if anyone does not have the Spirit of Christ, he is not his. Stay in God's word, it provides you freedom in so many different facets. Because without, without the truth of God's word, we, to a large extent, would not even understand what is right or wrong. And we would just continue to continue in our sin and be enslaved to the vices that um, human nature invariably uh, would put upon us. Notice in verse 14, for as many as are led by the Spirit of God, these are the sons of God. For you did not receive the spirit of bondage. The outcome is freedom, not bondage. The bondage again to fear, but you received the spirit of adoption by whom we cry out, Abba, Father. You know, fear... 
fear-based relationships, fear-based decisions are always some form of bondage. Verse 17, and if children then heirs, heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ, for if indeed we suffer with him, that if, for if indeed we suffer with him, that we may be glorified, to, glorified together. I can think of no greater freedom than what is described by the passage that we will conclude on, 1 John chapter 3. 1 John chapter 3. Behold what manner of love the Father has bestowed on us, that we should be called children of God. Therefore the world does not know us, because it did not know him. Beloved, now we are children of God, and it has not been revealed what we shall be. But we know that when he is revealed, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. And everyone who has this hope in him purifies himself just as he is pure." This is the ultimate outcome of staying in his word. Becoming a child of God and being like Jesus Christ, if I may say, in all material respects. You're free to go through walls, to time travel, to appear and disappear there can be nothing more liberating than eternal life where death is not possible. That's the truth. That's our destiny. That's what we have to look forward to. We may live in a post-truth world where we're attempting to bend reality to whatever the feeling of the day is. But in actuality, what's going to happen is facts will rule the day. And we learn truth from one source, the Bible. And the methodology is actually quite simple. Stay in it. And the outcome is as sure as the Boolean logic in which it was described. If if you stay in my word, you are my disciples indeed. You shall know the truth, and the truth will make you free.